broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, well, say good morning to everybody. Uh, this is Rob Macedo, and my amateur radio call sign is KD1CY for the amateur radio operators in the audience. And I'll be taking everybody through uh, today's uh, virtual Sky One class, the last one for the 2022 spring season at least and uh, I still see a few attendees uh, uh, signing on here so uh, uh, we'll give it a minute or so and we will get started. Um, uh, unlike the last class I taught a couple of weeks ago where the weather was absolutely gorgeous it's a little bit more dreary and uh, rainy on the south coast and cloudy elsewhere so hopefully uh, uh, folks will enjoy uh, today's class and take advantage of the gloomy conditions to uh, um, be with us for the entire session today. So I'll give it another minute or so as uh, the numbers I think are flattening out and uh, we will get started. All right, the numbers seem to have steadied out here, so why don't we, uh, without further ado, get started. Again, my name is Rob Macedo, amateur radio call sign for those that are amateur operators in the audience, KD1CY. I'll be taking everybody through today's Sky One presentation. Uh, I am not a meteorologist. I'm one of the uh, amateur radio coordinator volunteers for the office, and a few of us have been authorized to give uh, the uh, training uh, sessions, uh, we've been doing it for many years now, both live classes pre-pandemic and virtually uh, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, uh, it's great to be with everyone this morning. As I said, the weather isn't ideal for outdoor activities. So hopefully um, people will enjoy today's presentation on kind of a gloomy uh, Saturday here. Uh, so we'll, uh, without, without further delay, we'll get into the uh, program here. So what is the National Weather Service? It's weather behind the scenes. So obviously a lot of media out there, radio, TV, cell phones, and different weather apps, uh, certainly all kinds of weather information you can get on the internet, the newspapers, et cetera. And the National Weather Service is 122 local uh, weather forecast offices issuing forecasts and warnings. Uh, there's also the various national centers for environmental prediction, uh, places such as the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, and uh, the uh, National Hurricane Center for um, tracking tropical storms and hurricanes, and other kind of national centers that focus on climate, longer term prediction, um, support all of the weather models that all meteorologists use for their forecasts, um, river forecast centers that are uh, located uh, 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 regionally in, in areas, and then of course weather observations from all types of high-tech equipment, radar, satellite imagery, uh, weather balloons are still used, observations at airports, um, daily data collectors for, for which are the co-op observers and, and, and such, and then of course we have what we're going to talk about today which is Skywarn volunteer storm spotters. And uh, we play a unique role because despite all of the technology that's out there, um, ground truth spotter reporting is still the best way to know what is really happening on the ground. So what is the National Weather Service? It's a federal government agency. It's sponsored by the U.S. Department of Commerce. It's part of NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Of course, it does stand for a couple of other things, as the forecasters like to joke. Um, they say that it stands for um, the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. It could also stand for no organization at all. Again, I don't make the jokes. I just deliver the ones that you know, forecasters have, have put through the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the directive is protection of life and property, 
timely weather and river forecasts, and there's nationwide coverage with 122 local forecast offices and 11 national prediction centers. So uh, you can see on the right-hand corner of the map here all the different weather service for offices that are covering the uh, different areas. And then down on the right-hand corner is what our coverage area is, which is all of Massachusetts except for Berkshire County, all of Rhode Island, and Hartford, Tallinn, and Wyndham counties of northern Connecticut. Um, we used to have southern New Hampshire, but they were moved into the Gray Main office coverage area at the request of New Hampshire Emergency Management. And other than that exception, really, the, 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 the reason these coverage areas are as they are is depending on how well the Doppler radar sees into the different areas. So this is why the state of Connecticut is actually covered by three weather service offices, Albany, uh, which has the best view in the Litchfield County, uh, the New York City or Brookhaven, New York office on Long Island, which covers southern Connecticut, and then our office that covers um, the three counties of northern Connecticut. So they're split up by three different weather service offices. Berkshire County is covered under Albany, New York, along with southern Vermont, and that's how all the coverage areas are divided. You can see some weather service offices will cover just part of a, a state, especially if it's a big state. Others will cover um, different parts of, of several states, and again, it's all dependent on how well the radar sees into the given areas. A typical weather service forecast office, there's uh, 26 employees, meteorologists, technicians, and others, staffed 24 by 7, 365 days a year, uh, including weekends and holidays, and they, their duties are to handle all the observations, the uh, forecasts out to seven days, and all the watches and warnings that are, that are issued. So that is what happens at a typical weather service office. So why are you here? Well, I mentioned it uh, to a little bit earlier that we need eyes on the ground because particularly with severe weather and other rapidly changing weather situations, one third of warning decisions are based on reports. And sometimes the radar beam overshoots the core of the storm. So as the radar goes further and further out from where it is located, those lower beams of the radar will go higher and higher into the atmosphere because of the curvature of the earth. And so it can miss things that are happening in the lower portions of the atmosphere. And when that happens, it can be harder to know what is happening on the ground. And that's why storm spotters are so important. Um, in some severe weather situations where the, the core and the worst of the storm is in those lower levels and can't be seen on the radar, that's when we get into trouble in terms of not being able to see what's happening uh, at those lower levels, and that's why storm spotters are so important. So why are you here? Again, this is an example. This is June 23rd, 2015. This is the, uh, the radar imagery here of this storm that went on to produce an EF0 tornado here in um, just north of Mount Wachusett. There was no tornado warning issued. There had been some reports of possible rotation, but nothing really definitive. But this video surfaced that showed some tree damage that was uh, a survey team found and confirmed an EF0 tornado uh, just north of Mount Wachusett. Again, if we have some better ground truth telling us what's happening on the ground, then perhaps that, that warning would have been out. Um, uh, ahead of the storm. And then on the same day, there was also a tornado in Rentham, Massachusetts, and we had numerous reports of, of activity around that that supported a tornado warning and was confirmed by the Weather Service on the same day. So it gives you some uh, context of how important um, a spotter report can be uh, to the warning process. So what is Skywarn? It, it, that it's all of you, the civilian volunteers trained by the Weather Service who report specific weather conditions to the Weather Service. Wind gusts, hail size, ra rainfall, cloud formations, the average citizens and amateur radio operators, and the common bond is interest in weather and helping public safety. So we'll now get into what is a bad example of a Skywarn spotter, and hopefully the audio will, will come through for, for all of you here. Tornado right now. 
So, as we look at this bad example of a spotter, did we see a tornado in this video? No, we didn't. I mean, there's torrential rainfall, and if that continues, there could be flooding, but we don't see any. There's definitely some strong winds. That tree was bending over pretty good, but there's no wind damage to report. So there's nothing really reportable here yet. And there certainly isn't a tornado, and this is exactly what we do not want folks that get trained to be a spotter to do, see something that they want to see versus what's really happening. And um, sometimes, right, folks can get excited as well, and they're, they're, they badly want to help and report something, but just report per the criteria and what you're actually uh, 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 seeing is, is very important. So these are the reported tornadoes from 1950 to 2021, and you can see if you combine these counties together out through Worcester County, these, these tornado numbers are pretty similar. And then as you get into Southeast New England, uh, Rhode Island and Southeast Massachusetts, those numbers drop off. Well, why is that? Well, we oftentimes will get South and Southeasterly winds at the surface and West, Northwest and Northwest winds aloft to kind of get that turning in the atmosphere going. Well, oftentimes when that happens, particularly in May and June, right, we'll get a lot of low clouds and fog and cooler temperatures that will take down the levels of instability, even though you may have good turning in the atmosphere, which is important for tornadoes, you also need to have the instability. And so that's why these numbers are, are lower, but not zero. And there are certainly, um, as you get later into the summer, and sometimes we've seen now uh, on a couple of recent years in the fall, we can get conditions that can still produce tornadoes, especially here in in southeast New England. So something to keep in mind that that numbers are reduced, but they can still happen in this area. And certainly as you get further north and west, those numbers start to go up. You kind of combine these counties here. It's much the numbers are pretty close to a little, just the, only a little higher than what Worcester County has as a as a whole large county. So um, keep in mind the how this can kind of work, how the numbers can drop off in southeast New England, given it takes a little longer sometimes for severe thunderstorms and any type of tornadic activity to occur in southeast New England, but it can still certainly happen. If you look at 2021, we had 13 tornadoes in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, 11 in our coverage area. Um, all of them were of the weaker tornado variety. Uh, EF zeros to um, EF ones, perhaps in in a couple of the tornadoes in Connecticut outside of our coverage area. So they were much on the weaker side. And I think one of the things that's happening, which is kind of a good thing, is that I don't. In terms of our tornado numbers increasing, maybe they are a bit, but I think also what's increasing is our ability to detect these tornadoes, particularly the weaker um, tornadoes. Um, we we have a lot more technology and a lot more spotters to report conditions, report what they're seeing, and we're able to kind of, I think, discern more of these weaker tornadoes that have happened in New England than we did um, 15 or 20 years ago. And I think that makes a difference in terms of, of these numbers. But nonetheless, it's quite significant. And the 11 tornadoes in, in our area uh, in 2021 tied what we had in 2018. Uh, so uh, it was definitely a higher number year for tornadoes in our area. And then you see all the wind damage reports and the hail reports of one inch in diameter or larger. These reports reflect the first um, wind damage or hail report that confirms a warning or the first report that um, occurred if there was no warning issued. So we get a lot more reports as the warnings uh, are out and kind of continue over the time frame. But this represents, again, the the first report when the warning was issued or if no warning was issued and severe weather occurred. Um, preparedness uh, websites, uh, hopefully everybody checks out weather.gov slash Boston, uh, the local office that issues the forecasts and the local severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings, which means those conditions are imminent or occurring and they usually are over a, a local area. Then we have the Storm Prediction Center in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. They're the ones that issue these severe thunderstorm and tornado watches that cover several states that are kind of a heads up to say conditions are favorable for these things to happen. It doesn't mean it, it will over a given area, but those conditions are possible. The warnings issued by the local office that cover a county or, or portions of several counties, um, those, those warnings mean that those weather conditions are imminent or occurring. Uh, then there's the preparedness websites, ready.gov, 
uh, the Mass Emergency Management Agency website, the Rhode Island EMA and Connecticut EMA uh, websites that provide a lot of preparedness information, um, uh, both federal and state information that can be useful to prepare for severe weather. Certainly social media is a great vehicle to pass on um, severe weather information on Facebook and Twitter with the preparedness infographics that you see here below uh, at NWS Boston on Twitter. And if you look up NWS Boston on Facebook, you'll get to the Facebook page and, and Twitter feeds. And here, our amateur radio station, you know, amateur radio, for those that aren't as familiar, you know, it's certainly communications over radio, but it's also always been kind of a, its own form of, of social media amongst amateur radio operators. And we have a presence also on Facebook and on Twitter at WX1BOX, which is our FCC license call sign for our amateur radio station that resides at the uh, National Weather Service. It has been dormant because of, of the pandemic, but maybe this summer uh, that will change a bit and we'll be slowly getting back in, in there again. We'll see how things go as the pandemic evolves. But uh, we are on social media. We interact uh, with both our amateur radio community and non-amateur radio spotters to grab, gather reports and send it into the uh, uh, weather service. We share their information, their infographics on our pages. Um, uh, we post um, uh, our own uh, coordination messages, talking about our Skywarn activation status, et cetera, post information about presentations, Skywarn training like we're doing today, et cetera. And we also will post um, uh, a, a summary of reports and photos uh, uh, when we can with credit for situational awareness to folks and to get the word out about what our spotters are doing and, and how they're doing it well and reporting on the proper criteria information. And you see a couple of examples in the right-hand corner of the screen here. Certainly, NOAA Weather Radio is a great way to um, uh, have preparedness um, with up-to-the-minute watch and warning information comes directly from the Weather Service. Most radios will alert you when a warning is issued for your area by a tone or flashing light or both. These are all the different transmitters that are located all across uh, southern New England. So some of the information there. Uh, certainly many web and mobile apps out there um, available on iOS and Droid, right, to a lesser extent BlackBerry, uh, radar applications, NOAA weather radio applications, and certainly the capability of the wireless emergency alert, which can uh, alert us to um, tornadoes, certain levels of significant flash flooding, and even now some of the higher grade severe thunderstorm warnings. Not all severe thunderstorms are created equal, when we get severe thunderstorms that have uh, winds of 80 miles an hour or greater and very large hail, you will now get a wireless emergency alert for those kind of high-end severe thunderstorm uh, warning criteria. And of course, the WEA system is very good at night to alert you when you're sleeping of severe weather if you need to take action. So now let's talk a little bit about the ingredients of a thunderstorm. So we have several ingredients for thunderstorm development. We have moisture, lift, instability, and we'll later talk about um, the strong winds aloft or wind shear in the atmosphere that are also a key ingredient for the type of severe weather we will get. Um, we'll, we'll start with moisture, which forms the clouds and precipitation associated with thunderstorms. The primary source is the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, and to a lesser extent, the Great Lakes. You need to have good moisture uh, to be able to uh, start the, the thunderstorm process. Then you need instability, which is warm, moist air near the ground with cold air above it. Um, for those that see our weather messages, and we sometimes will describe, hey, we're seeing that there will be cooling air aloft. That is a key ingredient that increases instability. And with warm air at, at the ground and the cool air aloft, that's when we can generate a lot of instability. And the greater the instability, the more favorable the conditions are for thunderstorms. If it's warm at uh, aloft, cool at the surface, or sometimes right, we'll get really hot days, 95, 100 degrees, but no thunderstorms. That's when it's warm across that entire column. And there's, there's, there's just not the instability there to get the thunderstorm process going. So um, you need to have instability. And then sources of lift, which is the forcing mechanism that caused the air to rise to set that thunderstorm process in motion. And those sources of lift are typically fronts. And it's a, a boundary between two air masses. And they're classified by 
which air mass is replacing the other. So a cold front is cold air behind the front that's replacing warm air, and a warm front is warm air behind the front that's replacing cooler air. So we've mentioned here the warm front, warm air that's replacing cooler air. Generally, we don't get much severe weather from this, but sometimes we do. Um, it usually favors widespread continuous precipitation along and ahead of the front. Sometimes, though, conditions can be a certain way where we can get severe weather with um, warm fronts and sometimes um, even uh, isolated tornadoes because they tend to have a lot of turning in that atmosphere. But more often than not, we get more of a widespread continuous precipitation with a warm front. And again, that's warm air behind the front replacing um, cold air ahead of it. A cold front is what replaces the warmer air, and this is where we get most of our severe weather as we go through the spring and summer. It's a, it, uh, on the upward, it, 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 it forces the air uh, upward like a snow plow, and it's what gets those bands of showers and thunderstorms to form along and, and ahead of that uh, front. Uh, and there's typically a, a shift in wind direction with a change in pressure. So the pressure will fall ahead of the front and rise after it passes and the cooler air will follow behind the front. Sometimes it's right after the front passes and sometimes it's, it's actually a few hours after the, the front goes by that it will get cooler. Dry lines, they are a boundary separating moist and dry air, not really seen here in Southern New England. It typically lies in the central and Southern high plains. Um, during the spring and early summer, separating the moisture and moist air from the Gulf of Mexico to the east from the dry air in the southwest states. So when you get out into western Texas and, and parts of Oklahoma and some of the other uh, high plain states, that's where you'll see these, this phenomenon of a dry line, a boundary between moist and dry air. Now, one thing we do get here in southern New England are sea breeze fronts, and we've had strong to severe thunderstorms with sea breeze fronts, and it's a boundary between air that's coming, um, uh, winds that are blowing from the uh, water onto land versus a, a land breeze that's you know, blowing in the opposite direction, and that can be a source of lift um, during our, our severe weather season. This is an example from 2020 of a sea breeze front causing these thunderstorms. These were mostly uh, heavy downpours in the Weymouth area, but will go on to produce severe weather up here towards Waltham and Weston with uh, down trees and power lines, et cetera, with the right conditions and enough of the other thunderstorm ingredients to produce some severe weather. Orographic lift, which is um, air forced to rise and cool due to the terrain. Certainly we have plenty of hills and mountains like the Berkshires and the Worcester Hills, where you can get this moist rising air and the heavy rain here on one side of the, of the hill or mountain with dry descending air on the other side, and they're kind of a, a rain shadow. So this is a, another a source of lift that we can have here in Southern New England. The different thunderstorm stages, so you have the cumulus stage, and we certainly have days where we'll get cumulus clouds and they don't really do much, but when you start to add those thunderstorms and ingre ingredients into it, this cumulus stage can start building and building in the cumulonimbus clouds, and then you get into uh, the ability of having thunderstorms, maybe some strong to severe, you get to that mature stage of the of thunderstorm, and then you get to the dissipating stage where it kind of rains itself out, it kind of collapses underneath itself, and it starts to, to dissipate. So the, the three different thunderstorm stages. Uh, the life of a thunderstorm, as it releases the heat and fuels the storm and the thunderstorm progresses, the rain that cools the process down will eventually run out of energy and that's what kind of allows the storm you know, the the heat and the, and the release of it is what's fueling the storm and gets it going as it progresses the rain cools the entire process down and the energy is gone so this is a the, the life of a of a thunderstorm and how long it lives depends on various factors and and the type of of thunderstorm that it is which varies in, in, in type. We can certainly have the single cell and sometimes called pulse type of severe thunderstorm. And that has an occasional severe threat. And then as we get into the multi-cell clusters and multi-cell lines, that's where we have a greater threat for severe weather. And then the supercell is a significant severe weather threat. We'll kind of walk through these types of thunderstorms next. The single cell or pulse type of thunderstorms, they usually last about a half hour and they're occasionally severe. And we're not going to talk about severe and what's what is uh, 
classified as severe and what we're going to report on until the second part of the program, but they're occasionally severe. More often than not, they are not severe. More often than not, it's small hail, uh, but not quite reaching our severe criteria. Gusty winds, but not again, not quite to that severe criteria or just getting over those severe thresholds and minor flooding. And you can kind of see here the cumulus stage that then balloons up into the mature stage of the storm and then uh, ends up dissipating. The single cell storm, this is hopefully this is a dash cam, permanent dash cam view of a single cell storm. This is what it looks like on the radar. This is what the storm looks like um, uh, visually to an observer. You can see it, it's, it's kind of straight ahead of them. It's kind of straight up and down, could have some, some strong gusty winds for a period of time, small hail. Maybe it, it touches severe threshold, maybe some brief street flooding, but where it's a single cell storm kind of all by itself. And depending on the conditions, they kind of tend to rain themselves out and they are more often not severe, but may get to the severe threshold if it has enough going for it in terms of thunderstorm ingredients. So that brings us to the multi-cell clusters that they can last one to several hours and they may become severe, uh, potential for hail, strong winds and flooding. And there's a greater threat of these because you have kind of multiple cells kind of working in conjunction with, with one another and they may last longer because they're in a cluster and that's what makes these storms a little more capable of producing hail and larger hail and stronger winds and flooding. And we'll talk a lot about this feature, the shelf cloud along the leading edge of the storm and how that is typically where the strong and damaging winds are in a multi-cell cluster or line of storms. So we'll talk more about that as we go through things here. This is an example of cloud features associated with a multi-cell cluster of storms. Continuing here, this is a radar view from 2013 of clusters of multi-cell clusters of storms moving through uh, our area. And there were a number of reports of hail as big as quarter and half dollar size, even a golf ball size hail down towards the Longmeadow, East Longmeadow area, and some pockets of wind damage uh, from this uh, multi-cell cluster. The multi-cell lines, also known as squall lines, are a line of severe thunderstorms that can form along or ahead of a front or boundary, and they're linear in structure, and they can be more than 100 miles long, and they're often preceded by that shelf cloud that extends from horizon to horizon. And that shelf cloud under the shelf cloud can be a gust front, sometimes it's referred to as an outflow boundary, and that's where you could get your strong to damaging winds. You can see here a line of, of thunderstorms, and this was actually a case, again, the storms weren't very tall, but they didn't have to be that tall to produce severe weather. But when it was out in Western Mass and Western Connecticut, the radar beam was missing all of the core of the storm where the severe weather could take place. So it looked just like some showers on the radar, but it was actually thunderstorms producing strong damaging winds and wind damage and hail. And then as it got closer to the radar, you could see that it was an organized line of strong to severe thunderstorms. The multi-cell lines can last hours or even days, and they're often severe. And they're one of the most common types that, uh, that produce severe weather in southern New England. Uh, and certainly the single cell or pulse type of storms are our other common category here in southern New England. Uh, with the multi-cell lines, you can get uh, hail, including larger hail, damaging winds, and flooding, because it's kind of a line of storms working in conjunction together. And a few examples over the years, May 15th, 2020, this produced a lot of wind damage, especially across the southern New Hampshire, northern Mass border, and um, some more pockets of wind damage on the further south end of the line. Uh, we were in, a, in the, the Storm Prediction Center as categories for severe weather. We were in an enhanced risk for severe weather on this day on uh, May 15th. Uh, this was June 9th, 2011. We were actually in a, a moderate risk for severe weather. And this was a very potent line of severe thunderstorms that produced pockets of wind damage all the way to the Cape and Islands. Um, this would have been probably one of our most noted severe weather events of any season, but eight days prior was the Massachusetts tornado outbreak, including the Springfield tornado on June 1st, 2011. So um, it just, again, just depends on the season, how active it is, what you, what you may remember from a given season. Uh, with the squall line and shelf cloud, it's the, uh, 
Leading edge of the uh, of the gust front marks the leading edge of the updraft downdraft region of the squall line, and it slopes down away from the precipitation. So you'll get those outflow winds under the shelf. That's where you could get your potential wind damage as it moves from from west to east. So that's a squall line or, or shelf cloud uh, with the shelf cloud on the leading edge of the storm, and under it is those strong to damaging winds. And you can see it on radar, and sometimes they'll last quite a while away from a multi-cell cluster or line of storms. It attaches to the storm base, slopes away from the rain. It's produced by rain-cooled air. Even out here in, in northeast Connecticut, there were some wind gusts 30, 40 miles an hour from this particular event in July 2015. And the stronger winds are closer to the storms, and certainly they can it can fire off some additional storm activity where we had some more pockets of wind damage in uh, southeast Rhode Island uh, from these storms on this day in July 2015. The, the shelf clouds can look pretty ugly and they can have low hanging clouds on the underside of the shelf that are often mistaken for funnel clouds or tornadoes, but they're not. These are just cloud fragments, sometimes called scud clouds, and scud is not an acronym, it's just the, the name of these low hanging clouds. The thing you want to know is that they're under the shelf is the strong and damaging winds. They extend horizon to horizon. They can resemble snow plows, big waves, and spaceships. You can see the lightning here. And certainly, if you're on Race Point Beach and you're seeing this, it's time to pick up uh, from the beach and head indoors because um, the thunderstorm is approaching with certainly lightning, damage potential for strong and damaging winds under the shelf cloud, heavy rain, and hail. So, um, an example of a, a shelf cloud along the leading edge of a storm. And now we'll talk about supercell thunderstorms. An additional ingredient for stronger storms, and it, it can affect certainly multi-cell clusters and lines as well, but for supercells also is a stronger wind shield, that wind shear, that wind profile that allows horizontally oriented rolls to develop. And the, the shear can orient in a few ways. When we have directional shear, that's what allows us that turning in the atmosphere to get the potential for, for tornadoes. When we have speed shear and it's all in the same direction, that's what can enhance our multi-cell clusters and, and lines of storms with more of a straight line wind damage threat. The wind shear increases storm organization and, legit and longevity. It increases the threat for severe thunderstorms and better chance for rotation and tornado development, particularly when we have that directional shear that the wind speeds are, are strong and they veer with height. So when we get into these situations, if we don't have strong winds, the storms are kind of what I've, and I've kind of said this already a little bit, they're kind of straight up and down. They'll kind of go up and go down and kind of rain themselves out and they don't last long, you know, 30 minutes or less for a single cell, a bit longer for a multi-cell cluster or line. When we get the, those strong, the stronger wind shear, uh, that's what gets you that shared environment, the updraft tilts, the rain falls ahead of the updraft, and they can sustain themselves for much longer. And if it's turning in the atmosphere, that's when we can get our supercells when it's more unidirectional uh, in uh, shear and it's strong wind and, and with strong wind speeds. That's when we get more powerful uh, multi-cell lines of storms. Uh, supercell thunderstorms, they can last hours and they're most likely to become severe. They're the least common in the Northeast. You know, some years we'll have several supercells over given point, given points in an area. Other years, not so many. Um, you know, in your specific city or town, you may see one in a one in a very very great while over a long period of time. But when you look at our coverage area, we'll get a. You know, we could get anywhere from one or two to a handful or a dozen in a given season. It just depends on how active severe weather is in that year. <clears throat> Certainly large hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes are the biggest threats with supercell thunderstorms and the most likely threat for these, these types of supercells. The updrafts can surpass 100 miles an hour, and the most ideal conditions are when the winds are varying clockwise with height. So again, to get supercells, you want to have that turning in the atmosphere. When it's more unidirectional, you get you certainly still have a significant severe weather threat, maybe an isolated tornado threat, but then it becomes a greater threat for damaging straight line winds. And we're going to talk quite a bit now about the wall cloud, funnel cloud, and tornado that can occur in the updraft, downdraft region of these uh, supercell storms. And certainly you can get an overshooting top with these storms when you're looking from many miles away. So you can see here the overshooting top 
when you get that, it's punching above this anvil tropopause area where that's a very stable level of the atmosphere. So when you punch through that, that's when you get that overshooting top and you have the main storm tower uh, uh, underneath the, the, the storm, uh, which is where most of the severe weather will be. You look at the top down view, you can get um, some winds out ahead of the storm, followed by the heavy rain and hail, and right in this updraft downdraft region is where you can get the tornado to form. This is what the Springfield Mass June 1st, 2011 tornado looked like. This is all your rain and hail out ahead of it, and I can recall getting Skywarn Spotter and Amateur Radio reports of two inch hail in places like Fiskdale and Sturbridge, where this right here in Munson, we were getting the reports of significant damage to the Munson Police Station and structures in downtown Munson. And we're seeing what this is in precipitation here in this in this kind of ball like feature. This is what we call a debris ball. Um, one of the, the only ones I can remember from our coverage area over the last um, 20 plus years. 2011 was an extremely active severe weather season though, and, and there were many of these types of features across the U.S., but certainly very rare to see this here in southern New England. But um, this was again the 38 mile long uh, track of an EF3, high-end EF3 tornado rated at 160 mile an hour winds. And this was uh, going through the Munson area at this time and where we were getting reports of, of major damage. With supercells, we get a wall cloud, often with possible tornadic development, and it's an abrupt lowering of the rain-free base. And when seen up close, many clouds exhibit rapid upward motion and cyclonic rotation. However, not all wall clouds will rotate. This is an example of upward motion and rotation with a wall cloud here in, in the Kansas City uh, area. This is a wall cloud from Lemonster, Mass. in May 2014 which did not um, um, which did not end up producing a tornado or have upward motion or rotation, but it's clearly a wall cloud. You can see the rain um, uh, out ahead of it um, in that southwest trailing part of the storm where wall clouds can form. And we'll talk a little bit more about where they form here. They typically form in the rain-free base, which is a dark horizontal cloud base with no visible precipitation beneath it and typically marks the location of the thunderstorm updraft. And the tornadoes may form attached to this rain-free base. So you can see an example here of one forming, one that is fully formed here. Again, you can see the rain uh, ahead of this trailing feature where the wall cloud forms, and it forms in that updraft, downdraft region of the uh, supercell storm. So we've spent quite a few minutes here talking about wall clouds versus shelf clouds because it's very important to note these features and the differences in these features. So you have the shelf cloud. It's an outflow feature. It slopes away from the rain. It's associated with the squall line and it's at the leading edge of the storm with a shelf cloud feature that extends from horizon to horizon. So here in this video here, the threat is for strong to damaging winds affecting this this fair or, or flea market that's going on, whereas this wall cloud is an inflow feature that slopes towards the rain. It's associated with a supercell, and it's at the rear of the storm, and it does not extend horizon to horizon. So you can kind of get a difference between what you're seeing from a shelf cloud versus a, a, a wall cloud. And know the difference. You, can, you don't have to be a radar expert to kind of understand, well, what am, where am I in location of the storm and what could I be looking at? So you see these several discrete cells here on the radar. They all kind of have a hook echo type feature. Uh, not all hook echoes produce tornadoes, but every uh, tornado has a hook echo. So in this case here, if you're ahead of any one of these storms, you're going to be seeing B potentially, potentially a wall cloud. Whereas if you're, you're over here in front of this line of storms, you could be seeing the shelf cloud feature. And under the shelf could be the strong to damaging straight line winds associated with that. So again, don't have to be a radar expert. You can kind of look at what kind of cells am I looking at? What could I be seeing and kind of figure out, okay, what am I looking at uh, uh, in the sky? And what's the difference in these features? So again, you see B associated with the wall cloud and A associated with the shelf cloud with this line of storms. Both are public safety risks. So certainly if you're getting 40, 50, 60 mile an hour wind gusts at this kind of flea market park here, that could, it's enough to blow 
tents over, could blow some, blow down some trees, etc. It's definitely a public safety hazard. As much as this wall cloud feature here in Lincoln, Rhode Island, would eventually go on to produce the EF0 tornado in Rentham, Mass. And we talk a little bit about the funnel cloud. That's a rotating column of air not in contact with the ground. As the funnel descends, the water vapor within it will condense so that you can make the it can actually see the funnel. And it can be confused with scud because it, you know, it 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 the biggest difference is that it's attached to the cloud base and you should see upward motion and rotation with a funnel cloud. You look here at this May 2013 video, and I'll play it again here. This is it looks like scud but it was actually had upward motion and rotation and this actually was a weak ef0 tornado in stoughton mass that moved trailers large trailers in this garage here down to few trees very localized and if it wasn't for this video and some efforts of our amateur radio skyward spotter community to go check this out i don't know if this would have been classified as a tornado but it was it was and it's on the weak side EF0 tornado type of, of situation. And that's what can happen. In this stage here, it was actually a funnel cloud that had lifted and was not in contact with the ground at that point. Tornadoes are a violently rotating column of air that is in contact with the ground. This is an example from July 2014 of a tornado uh, on the ground in Walcott, Connecticut. And it sees it may have been a little bit of a multi vortex with some of the smaller vortices on the ground doing damage and the larger vortex just above the ground you can see some of the debris flying in the air but uh, clearly this was a tornado that was on the ground in walcott connecticut and again that's the violently rotating column of air that is in contact with the ground so tornado formation you'll get these horizontal rolls in the atmosphere and when you have a strong updraft it will get picked up and with the, it get, connects in with the updraft downdraft interface that's when you get the wall cloud, funnel cloud, and if it touches the ground, the tornado to form. And this is just an example of, of how this formation takes place. And we've talked quite a bit there, are, uh, the e EF scale or the enhanced Fujita scale, it ranges from EF zero to EF five and type of damage that it causes. And, and the rating is given based on the type of damage that, that occurs over an area and is typically surveyed by the weather service. Sometimes some of the weaker ones can be determined without being on site, but off, more often than not, they are uh, looked at for the type of damage that they do and the severity of the damage. So let's talk a little bit about situational awareness and how you sometimes may have to go from spotter to somebody that's actually uh, needs to take shelter. This is in Howell, New Jersey in 2017. So as you can see here, great that they're seeing and spotting the tornado, but at, it's at, when it's in the parking lot and you're kind of going out to view it, that's pretty dangerous because any flying debris, if it kind of heads towards the direction of the store, if there's any flying debris that hits those windows, it could cause, it cause it obviously can cause damage and potentially injury. So you want to be able to view it, but then you want to take a step back and, and think of safety as well. We don't want anybody to get hurt while they're, while they're spotting. So from an awareness perspective, what if you had a smartphone and saw this storm system coming at you on radar? What would you do and where would you go if this was the Indianapolis State Fair? Now, I know for the Indianapolis State Fair, there was some issues with the grandstand and, and so forth, um, how to, you know, and how it was constructed. But certainly with the, uh, with, with this grandstand, you're out in, in, in public tents, et cetera, you see this on radar and perhaps a, a, a shelf cloud being on the radar, an outflow boundary being detected, you're going to get strong winds. It's something that you may have to think about. Where can I go to be safe along with reporting if it's safe to do so? In awareness, now we've kind of given you the basics of what to look for. 
always observe the sky and your surroundings and be an active spotter. This ended up being a, a cloud fragment that would get more interesting as it approached Boston. This is cloud to ground lightning from July 4th, 2012 that briefly evacuated the Esplanade during the fireworks. Being aware of your surroundings. This is the St. Louis airport in 2011. Uh, folks are uh, kind of milling about the airport at first. Looks like just a, a normal day at the airport, but then you start seeing uh, this person uh, running uh, here for like the hallway. Some folks going to the bathroom here. Maybe this uh, store serves some bad food, but as you, as you keep watching and seeing uh, folks uh, moving around, and this is 2011, so this might have been a little bit before smartphones were more available. See this TSA agent running for the bathroom. And then you see these folks from TSA running in, and then you see this here, all of the winds uh, blowing this around. This was actually a tornado that struck the St. Louis airport, and the air control tower knew exactly was going, what was going on, but no one told the terminal. And so this could have been pretty dangerous, but luckily folks took cover. And again, this is just talking about being aware of your surroundings. So ask yourself, where am I and where is the worst of the storm? We don't want folks putting themselves in harm's way for a report. Where is the primary threat compared to where I am? And what direction is the storm moving relative to me? So we'll walk through some radar and cloud formations here in the next few slides. So radar versus real life. This is a, a storm uh, that's approaching here. And it looks like a shelf cloud type of feature. So under the shelf could be the strong and damaging winds. Looking at the radar. I think I would be located at number two, which is on the outer cape. You can kind of see that shelf cloud feature on the radar, which, where, which where the strong winds could be, followed by the heavy rain and hail of the thunderstorms. Now with squall lines, the, there are portions of the line that are stronger than other parts of it. And the part that kind of bows out or surges ahead uh, of the line is where is the strongest portion of the squall line and the greatest threat for severe weather. So that would be up here in southern New Hampshire. That doesn't say there couldn't be some pockets of damage down here, but this is the worst part of the squall line. Uh, and the bow echo type of signature, you could get strong to damaging winds. You could even get a brief tornado at that head of the bow, um, but generally it's more uh, strong to damaging winds. And this person is located right here where the the line, the the surging part of the squall line or bow echo is, and I'm not sure why we went all the way back to the bottom here, but we'll get back on track here in just a second. Um, so sorry about that, folks. Okay. So from a squall line bow echo perspective, you can note the correlation of the actual shelf cloud in the radar image. So here you see the inflow notch uh, here, and you can see this curvature in the this part of the storm here. And this is the strongest part of this line because it's kind of surging forward with this inflow notch pushing it ahead. And you can see that curvature of the earth, of the uh, clouds right here. So you can kind of Again, not without, you don't have to be a radar expert. You can kind of look at the cloud features, kind of look at the radar, kind of gain a bearing of where you are. And both show that emphasized curvature. Radar versus real life again. This is the shelf cloud uh, along the leading edge of the storm. And yes, there's some ugly looking cloud fragments that are hanging low, but they're just that. Cloud fragments or scud clouds. You can see it on the radar here that you're located ahead of these storms right here. And you could see the strong and damaging winds first, followed by heavy rain and hail. There was actually a tornado warning out for this storm, but it ended up just producing the strong and damaging straight line winds with gusts as high as 60 miles an hour and one inch hail when these storms went through. Spotter positioning. So this is back to uh, June 1st, 2011. Uh, this person is located here. And we play the video here. So there, this storm is moving from left to right, west to east. And the tornado is kind of pulling away from them. And uh, so they're in a good spot to view the tornado. Uh, it's safe. They don't know how much damage is doing, but it's clearly on the ground doing damage. And they can say it's moving to the east away from where their position is. So they're in a good spot to view this, this tornado and say that it's on the ground. They can't tell the extent of the damage. 
Now, where this person here is a little bit more problematic. Now, they would be okay in this situation because the storm kept moving from west to east, but they often, these storms will tend to right move, and if it right moves, this tornado is going to come right at them. So, again, they can, it's, they, they have trees obstructing them, but there was some debris that uh, went through here on the video, so they can tell that it's on the ground based on that doing damage. Again, they don't know the extent of the damage, but they need to be really careful because if the storm right moves, which they sometimes do, this tornado is going to be headed right for them. And again, this is also from June 1st. This person is right here looking at this tornado, and unless it makes a turn toward them, they're not going to see it. They certainly may have had big hail and heavy rain and maybe some strong winds, but they're not likely in a good position to view the tornado because it's going to move left to right and they're not going to get a good view of it between the obstructions, the heavy rain and hail, etc. Uh, for this person here, they're on the outer edge of the storm. Unless this were to suddenly make a turn toward them, they're really not going to see much, not to mention the obstructions. They're not going to see much here because the storm is moving left to right. So if you look at this, right, this was a 38 mile long, you know, quarter to half mile wide tornado doing big damage across numerous communities. But it's, you know, a number of neighborhoods and, and a fairly localized area where the most significant damage is. And that's why we need so many spotters, especially in situations like this for severe weather, because that area that's affected with damage can be really isolated, even in a very significant tornado like this one was, a high end of 3 you're talking about a quarter to a half mile wide area of several communities over 38 miles. So that's why we need so many spotters um, for reporting purposes. Another example here, Michael Rossiker lost his home in the Munson uh, tornado in August 2014. He was li living in Worcester at this time. And you can see in his night vision um, uh, camera here, the strong winds and briefly a tornado forms uh, right here to, to the right of uh, uh, the camera here. He had wind gusts over measured over 40 miles an hour. We had two amateur radio Skywarn spotters. We were actually at the uh, weather office. We were actually training a couple of new operators, and they got to see how quickly things could change. It was a fairly quiet late afternoon and early evening then we started to get these storms at first it looked like more of just a flooding threat with two or th and three inches of rain in an hour and a few of these storms but then the wind signature developed over worcester and we had two amateur radio sky one spotters one in clark university reporting that um the soccer tents at his soccer field at the university were blown over and a second spotter actually lives in millbury but was driving through worcester at the time said, I've got trees down in front of me, and I saw one tree get picked up and thrown in the air. And that's what prompted the uh, tornado warning. The signature was very brief, as these typical weak tornadoes are. Um, but between the damage reports, et cetera, the, the tornado warning was issued, and an EF0 tornado was confirmed in Worcester several hours later. We had photos come in from the area. Um, uh, one of the meteorologists, the former meteorologist in charge of the Weather Service, Bob Thompson, who lives in uh, um, the Westboro area came to Worcester and confirmed an EF0 tornado. So um, this is how spotter reports can be so integral to the warning process. And also the lack of reports can, can, can affect the warning process as well. So this is in Revere. There were severe thunderstorm warnings uh, here back through the medium area and up into this area. But a lot of the reports we were getting were just of flooding. It was in the middle. Of, it was on a on a Monday morning in July, uh, and and we were getting a lot of flooding reports. Not much for wind damage. You saw the tree that fell in the video here. There was some reports of rotation in Brookline that we didn't get hear about till a bit later. Then we started to hear about significant damage in Revere. And this would go on to produce straight line wind damage up towards the Beverly area. This was the EF2 tornado in Revere. It blew out windows, caused damage to some, some buildings, but was only on the ground for about four or five minutes. We did find out about six hours later that there was storm damage in the Needham Mass area, but it was six hours later. So this is how important a spotter report can be. Getting the reports even after the fact several hours later is helpful as well, but when we get them in near real time, it can be factored into the warning process. I think it, if there were more reports of damage, the severe thunderstorm warning, which did have a tornado possible tag in it, would have probably been extended up into this area at least. Um, instead, it, was, it had been dropped for a few minutes, and then a tornado warning was issued after the damage 
uh, in, in Revere. This is Walcott, Connecticut, and this was the day before the Revere uh, tornado. The person is here. Very hard to see anything here that looked tornadic, but they can see some upward motion and rotation. They may be able to move position safely, see if they can get a view of it. They don't know that if it's on the ground or in, in such, but again, just talking about some of the challenges of spotting. In this case, some challenges on the radar because pretty hard to discern anything here that looked tornadic, but clearly uh, it was um, from some of the prior videos. This person here didn't have a great view of it other than some upward motion and rotation that was visible. They may have been able to, to change positions to get a better look at, at, at the uh, tornado from Wolcott, Connecticut in July 2014. So we've hit the break here. I, I did see a few questions uh, in the uh, uh, panel here, so and we've got a few minutes. So let me uh, hit some of this. Um, so yeah, this person, they had, hadn't seen the visual portion. I had, had taken a minute to start it up, uh, and that was solved. Um, a copy of the presentation, what I'm hoping to do, and I am, we are recording the session, is I will, I'm hoping to get the uh, presentation posted up online so folks can uh, view uh, the video uh, presentation. So uh, that covers um, uh, that question. Um, I will see if we're allowed to kind of PDF the presentation and put that up. Uh, we've typically, what we've done is just recorded it and then put the uh, recording up uh, and made that available. Um, so the process in the atmosphere for how wind shear makes supercells more powerful and, and dangerous. I think it's pretty easy to explain from the perspective of the stronger the winds, the greater the threat for supercells, and also the stronger the winds and turning in the atmosphere. Um, if it's more in the same direction, that's when you get the greater potential for stronger straight line winds. It doesn't mean you, you won't get a tornado, just means that the straight line winds are a bigger threat. But the turning in the atmosphere with the uh, uh, strength of the uh, the winds is is uh, uh, the, the key to, to supercell development. A good app for your phone to see radar. So this is not a weather service recommendation. It's a Rob Macedo amateur radio coordinator recommendation. But um, um, I personally use Radar Scope. It has worked pretty well for me overall. They did have some issues with it a few weeks ago. Um, I haven't seen those issues in a while. It, they were kind of tough issues at first, and I was starting to think about, do I need to look at another radar app? But that's what I use. Um, um, is I still use is radar scope. Some folks say I think it's called My Radar is another interesting app, but I have not used that one uh, personally. Uh, the, one person had their internet drop a, a, a few times. Um, uh, like I said, we I am recording this. So I'm hoping to get that um, posted. Some folks are suggesting Radar Omega as a, a, a another alternative app along with Radar Scope. Um, the difference between a microburst and an EF0 tornado is simply a microburst is a burst of wind that is, that is a straight line wind that we'll talk about in the second part of the training that blows the trees down and largely in one direction, whereas an EF0 tornado is, ro is tree damage that is rotating. And um, sometimes microbursts can be stronger than EF0 tornadoes. Other times they're about the same, except for the type of directional damage that they, they use. So um, that's... Uh, uh, some information there, and and then some other folks are mentioning uh, radar scope as a as a good app to uh, use here. So um, I think that covers uh, the uh, questions uh, that we had here, and we had a few minutes to go through that. I am running solo. Sometimes we have another person out that also tries to um, answer the questions. So I appreciate folks' patience with uh, me getting uh, to those uh, uh, questions uh, here. Uh, so with that, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, 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 we, we're going to uh, take a break here. Uh, uh, we'll try to uh, get back. We'll we'll say uh, I'll probably come back on here in about um, six or seven minutes, and we'll look at uh, restarting again at about eleven ten. And we're making good time here. We should finish here. I would say by by twelve or maybe a few minutes after twelve if we take some some questions here at the end. So. I appreciate everybody uh, sticking with me. I hope uh, folks are enjoying the uh, presentation, as I said, on a kind of a gloomy Saturday morning, unlike the training I did two weeks ago on a Saturday, which was which was gorgeous. So I'm glad to see everybody here, and uh, I'll be back in about um, uh, six or seven minutes, and we'll start back here at about 11.10. Thank you.
All right, we'll say good morning again, folks. So uh, we'll get started again here in a couple of minutes, but I am back here and if there's any other uh, questions, we'll uh, uh, we'll kind of hit some of those now while we're we're uh, while we're waiting for folks. Um, um, thanks uh, to folks for the kudos on the uh, uh, presentation. I, I appreciate it. Um, I'll mention windy.com is a real cool tool for tracking different data components, et cetera, uh, uh, if folks are interested on that. How do you actually report a weather event if you are a weather spotter? Well, uh, Anthony, uh, stay tuned and we will talk more about that. That's the second part of the uh, program here. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, wind gauge recommendations. So again, these are not weather service sanctioned recommendations, but I'll give you that they're kind of my perspective, personal perspective on, on recommendations. Um, certainly the Davis weather stations have uh, great weather uh, wind gauge instruments and have had some historical wind gusts uh, gathered over the years. They can be kind of pricey. Um, uh, the other uh, up and coming, I'd call it, um, uh, weather instrument is the, um, the weather flow uh, sensors uh, that are uh, that are uh, available. There are also some uh, good uh, wind gauge uh, uh, recommendations. Um, how is climate change affecting tornadoes? Um, so that's a hard question, at least for me to, to answer. Um, you know, in terms of, as I said, I, I do think part of why we're seeing more tornadoes reported than ever before is because we are detecting a lot more of the weak tornadoes than we ever have before. Um, they really haven't been, you know, if you look at 2018 and 2021, they were all EF0. I think there may have been one or two EF1s, but all very, very weak. So um, I think that is a function of better technology, videos, et cetera, a couple with more spotters. Um, that's equaling more of these tornadoes being seen. Um there have been seasons, honestly, in 2018, and I think even last year, the, the tornado numbers in Oklahoma were way, way down. <laughs> um, so um, how is climate change affecting it? I think we're still trying to understand that. I know that some of the predictions have been that we'd see far more because the, the earth is, is and, and such would be warming. But as you know, we also need cooling aloft in the atmosphere along with the warmth to kind of produce the conditions. I think some experts are still looking at that. Certainly, there's a concern around climate change resulting in more severe weather. And 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 I think it may be more that our patterns are different. Like we'll get into patterns where we may be dry for much longer than we used to be and patterns where we are wet way longer than we used to be. And that is more of the, of the effect of some of, of the climate change. And I think that is, um, uh, I think that's some of what's going on here. Um, why, why have we been a lot, it's been a lot, seeing a lot of wind lately? Is it more than normal? It's pretty typical, honestly, this time of year. March is usually a pretty windy month into April and early May. I think it, it's a function of these kind of big upper level lows that we'll get that kind of sit for days. That's why we're going to be cloudy and, and, and such and, and cool for several more days before we hopefully break into summer heat as we get towards the latter part of next week. So I think it's it's pretty normal. I uh, and you know we have had a couple of, of stronger storm systems. The one right after the uh, Boston Marathon, at least down here in southeast New England, we had wind gusts sixty to seventy plus mile per miles per hour. Um, so uh, I think we've you know we we've had a couple of stronger wind events. But I think overall, I'm not too surprised to see the kind of windy days that we that we've had. Um, this spring. We usually get this to happen in the spring and we see another maximum of, of that in the fall as we change seasons. Um, does the NWS Norton have DMR access? And and the, yes, there is the New England DMR uh, weather net on Thursdays at 730. Um, I do have DMR equipment. I haven't had a chance to set it all up yet. Um, and I, I am looking to try to get to that um, here so I can participate in some of that. We typically have had some folks help out and monitor DMR for us because even in our when we're active at our amateur radio station at the Weather Service, we have um, three radios. We can monitor four frequencies at the same time. We don't have a 
a specific radio for DMR, though we can certainly bring in a DMR radio when we go to the weather office. I can certainly have it at my home. So it's been a matter of just, you know, we've been using folks to help monitor DMR for us versus having some of us on there directly. I am looking to try to, to get um, more presence there, including from myself. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how that piece goes. Um, and yes, you know, weather stations on Weather Underground are useful to Skywarn. We do try to monitor as many of them as we can. So that's another uh, way to, uh, for us to gather information. We, we monitor the APRS weather stations, the CWAP weather stations, um, Davis Weatherlink, Tempest Weatherflow. There's so many. And we actually can use help of folks who, uh, monitoring some of those stations uh, for us and bringing some of that information to us because there's so many different stations out there and some have criteria and, and some may not. Um, what does digital mo mobile radio do? So that's DMR. It's a mode that we as amateur radio operators uh, can use and it is used in some um, commercial uh, radio uh, systems and and that's what the the uh, the DMR uh, um, uh, it, it, you know that's what it, DMR is and what it's a part of and yes there have been you know certainly some issues with some of the tree health that Brian mentions especially out in in central mass I think tree damage has significantly increased because of that I think it's also increased because we've had some some stronger higher end storms over the years. Some of the storm nor'easters we've had in October 2017, 2019, 2021, uh, the duration in 2020 and such. When we get those kind of winds, you're going to get damage. Period. And and I think that's a part of it. And you know, it has also been 30 plus years since we've had a a landfalling hurricane in southern New England, and that does its thing about hitting not only the healthy trees, but clearing out a lot of the, the, the weaker trees as well. And it's been a while since we've had that, so that may be a factor as well. Some folks have asked about, you know, there's a brush fire along the pike eastbound. Thanks, Lydia, for that. There are some fire weather products, and, and, and we don't report criteria on fire weather, but there's a fire weather program that the Weather Service uh, has. That's what factors into whether you can burn brush and, and such and have burning permits and be able to burn on given days. Um, uh, they do have a fire weather watch and red flag warnings, and they sometimes issue special weather statements around fire weather. So that's another way um, uh, that that's another thing that happens with fire weather. Uh, I have a person in Southwest New Hampshire and send reports to Gray. Yes, we will share info with Gray, Maine. If you send it to us on Facebook or Twitter or amateur radio, we can get the information to Gray directly as needed. Um, same thing as if you were in Gray's area, if you're a Gray, Maine spotter and you were in our area and you gave a report for our area to Gray, Maine, they would get it to us. So yes, there's sharing of that information um, between weather service offices all the time. So um, so that covers the questions. We should probably get on to the uh, uh, program uh, here. And um, a couple other things, though, I will mention quickly is um, I mentioned our Facebook and Twitter feeds. Our website is wx1box.org. Uh, uh, we also have an email list where we post our coordination messages about activation when there's training sessions, et cetera, in Skywarn or other weather-related topics. If you're interested in being part of the list, this is my email address, and you can uh, email me uh, your information, and uh, we will uh, – post that um, uh, out there to folks. So I put that in the uh, the question pool and I will put it out to uh, um, in the chat so folks have it if you want to be part of that list. And if you are a part of the list already or you're not sure, if you subscribe with the same email address, the list is smart enough to know whether you're a dupe or not. And it's an announcement only list, so you won't get a lot of chit chat between spotters about what a storm is going to do or whatever we're pushing out announcements only and that's what the list is intended to do and we've wired it in such a way where where we are, are, are able to uh, prevent any kind of chit chat over the, the the system we are working on trying to get some additional technologies going on reporting and sending in reports and if we do get that type of activity going we will uh, mention that on the email uh, list uh, as well um, so, um, so stay tuned for that. 
So uh, with that, we'll uh, get started with the uh, uh, training and uh, uh, the second part of the show. And, uh, and this is where we'll talk about what you report, how you report it, et cetera. So uh, I think we deliberately put it on the second part of the show to, for, so folks um, can, can stick around and uh, uh, view that. So uh, we'll get um, restarted here. And if it were only that easy, so spotting in New England, we got a lot of issues. We have a lot of obstructions, trees, uh, animals, if you will. Certainly can't be chasing down uh, Route 128 at rush hour. And uh, here's an example. This was July 1st, 2013 in Windsor, Connecticut. You can see a, uh, a, a tornado on the ground. You can see the damage here. Uh, uh, this was to some... Um, uh, tobacco uh, netting that was thrown across and you can see the person kind of move toward where that that damage went you know where did the tornado go they kind of took their eye off the tornado now understandable because you don't see that here often and uh, you end up uh, uh, getting distracted by seeing damage that's flying across above the highway <laughs> so um, these are just some of the things that you know are challenges in spotting certainly trees here this was I can recall getting a report of, oh, there's a tornado on the ground in Lincoln, Rhode Island. Well, and this was the, and we got a picture of it. Well, this is what we got. I'm safe in calling this a wall cloud. I can kind of see that feature and, and, and such, but that's about all I can see here. I don't know if it's on the ground, if there's a funnel cloud or tornado associated with this. I can't tell from this picture. Um, and then our tornado sometimes can be rain wrapped. That's when that rain free base ends up uh, being wrapped in rain. And so when that happens, it, you know, if our tornadoes are wrapped in rain, um, notice cars here in this video. It took a second or two to load up here, but notice now in the video, um, it's common for our tornadoes to be wrapped in rain. Notice cars are driving straight into the tornado, unaware uh, of what's happening. So uh, uh, some examples of uh, things that we deal with. The Great Barrington Tornado of May uh, 1995 was rain wrapped. Nobody saw it. And, and, and that was the reason, because it was, it was rain wrapped. The June 1st tornado was not, and that's why there's many, many videos and pictures of that tornado. Um, we talk, talk a little bit about water spouts. They can happen in fair weather, but they're fairly weak, 30 to less than 60 miles an hour, and form from water to cloud or cloud to water. Um, they, they, those are actually fr fairly rare. The wa water spouts we've seen over the years uh, form just like tornadoes, just over the water with rotation in the storm and winds 65 miles an hour or higher. We had a question earlier about microbursts. So microbursts and straight line winds, uh, it's when evaporation can cool a parcel of air, causing it to become heavier and dense, and that's what accelerates it to the ground, and then it starts to, it'll start off narrow and then kind of spread out in all directions, taking down things in the same uh, direction. Uh, microbursts are la last less than five minutes and affect an area less than two and a half miles wide. This was out in Groton. Damage from a microburst from that line of storms that you saw in the first part of the show on May 15th, 2020. Significant damage in Groton and Westford, Mass, among a few other places uh, from those uh, storms. And larger downbursts that go more than two and a half miles wide are called macrobursts. And uh, Definitely can cause uh, issues to aviation and plane to lose altitude quickly. Um, this was June 5th, 2010, a time lapse in Bradley Air National Airport where there was microburst activity with a line of storms in northern Connecticut. That was a pretty active weekend of severe weather. We had tornado watches both on June 5th and June 6th, 2010. And we had a macroburst go through portions of the suburbs of Boston into uh, the city of Boston. We had one amateur radio operator report the roof torn off of his, the apartment complex that he was living in. Um, and he gave the report calmly on air, and I talked to him afterwards, and he was a wreck and was very, very scared of what happened. And it was an interesting event because it caused significant tree damage in Boston, and that's when the city of Boston really amped up further their, their weather preparedness. They realized that if a microburst could cause several days' worth of storm damage cleanup, what could a... A, a similar magnitude storm that had a lot more duration um, uh, due to the city. And they really amped up their, their weather preparedness from that incident on June 6, 2010. So now let's talk a little bit about look-alike clouds, cloud fragments that briefly resemble funnel clouds or tornadoes and hang low at the base of the parent clouds. We get a lot of these clouds that can result in false, false reports. Again, this is just a scud cloud or a cloud fragment. It's not really connected well to the cloud base in this picture. 
Um, other examples, rain shafts, you know, we'll get downward motion and we'll get, you know, you can see these from the highway. We'll get these rain shafts. Sometimes we can get hail shafts and you want to be patient and verify what you're looking and see what you're looking at, what you're seeing to reduce the false number of reports to NWS. We're not trying to scare people from reporting. We're just getting people to really pay attention and look at, at, at what they're seeing before they report in something. Another example here, this looks like it's a, something that's touching the ground, but again, it's not connected to the cloud base. Low clouds, scud clouds, cloud fragments, we get these often here. This was March 2016, and I remember, I, I recall this being reported, and you know, there was, that wasn't even a thunderstorm day, but what they were seeing is, this is low clouds and, and low clouds here, fog in the valley, looks like it's touching the ground, looks like it's a funnel-like shape, but again, these are just low clouds and fog, and Man, we get a lot of that here, especially this time of the year. Uh, this is a uh, cloud feature here. It looks like it might be in the right spot for something. Uh, it looks like maybe a rain-free base, but it's not really connected to the cloud base here. Um, again, nothing uh, reportable here. Uh, this, might, this might look suspicious. Well, we got trees in the way, but it also looks like the rain is, is uh, here. If this is moving left to right, this could likely be just... Um, some low-hanging clouds along the leading edge of the storm and is not um, part of the wall cloud feature. Uh, this is another uh, example from uh, Linden State College. Again, low clouds here. Looks like it's reaching the ground, but again, it's just cloud fragments and, and low clouds here. So again, not trying to discourage reporting, just trying to get folks to really think about what they're seeing and, and viewing before they report. And we want folks to make sure they stay safe because you don't you want and use common sense because we don't want folks getting caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with this bull in Spain. And yes, you'll see here in a moment that that you know talk about putting yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, pulling on the bull's tail. Not really a good idea. So again, just some levity around safety and, and using common sense when, when you're spotting. So now let's talk a little bit about tornado safety indoors. So you want a shelter, you want a shelter or place to take cover that should include being down at the lowest level under something sturdy, cover your head, and keep in shelter until the storm has passed. And have a first aid kit, shoes, and a whistle where this is located. And you say, well, when, when am I really going to use this? Well, I ask the folks that were affected by the June 1st tornado. If you can Put some stuff aside and remember it in 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 a a safe place, the interior room on the lowest floor, like a closet or bathroom, or ideally a basement. And having this stuff handy, you know, could be could be very helpful if you're you're affected by something like the June first tornado. So, um, pretty simple stuff that it can take a few minutes and can be helpful in this situation. Tornado safety in cars is certainly trickier. You want folks to find a, a, a reinforced shelter if possible. Um, as a last resort, if a ditch isn't near, buckle in and lower your head below window level in your car. Otherwise, find a ditch or ravine. I know some folks look at, well, what about um, uh, you know those overpasses? Well, if a tornado is close enough, those winds can actually accelerate under that overpass and can actually be more dangerous. So obviously, a reinforced shelter. A ditch or ravine second, and if not, you know, stay in your car and buckle in and lower your head below uh, window level. So uh, um, certainly a tough place to be is to, is close to a tornado in a car. You know, I, I remember seeing earlier this year the truck in Austin, Texas area that had been literally flipped um, on its, uh, you know, flipped over and then flipped back again, and the person continued to drive it very shaken after the tornado passed through. Um, very tricky place to be in a, in a car. Uh, another example here of flying debris and the dangers that poses in a car. This two by four right through the windshield of this vehicle in Cookville, Tennessee. A uh, similar thing happened with the Great Barrington tornado in 1995 where it went through the, the, the passenger door of the car and nearly perforated the driver that two by four did, but it peeled back the foam rubber seat cushion of the, of the car uh, seat so that the person only ended up with a broken hip. So tornado sheltering guidelines, clearly interior room or basement are the best options. Certainly there are 
FEMA safe rooms and tornado storm shelters, but I think certainly an interior room on a well-constructed home or building or a basement are the best options. Stay away from large open rooms like gyms, manufactured housing, mobile homes, vehicles underneath the uh, highway overpass. You want to find a better option to take cover um, from a tornado. Lightning safety, so 17 fatalities in 2020, zero fatalities in southern New England, 20 fatalities in 2019, zero in southern New England um, uh, uh, that year. Most people struck by lightning live and, 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 and can be treated. Um, you don't have to worry about getting a shock or anything if you're treating someone that's been struck by lightning. And remember, when thunder roars, go indoors. Remain in cover until 30 minutes after the final clap of thunder because Lightning can strike a good 15 to 20 miles away from the storm center. So keep that in mind from a uh, lightning safety uh, uh, perspective. Then high wind and hail safety, you want to use common sense, know where you are in relation to the storm, and stay inside away from windows. Most manufactured homes are not built to withstand sustained hurricane force winds of 75 miles an hour. So this was both of these, uh, the picture and the video here are from August 4th, 2015. A round of storms in Rhode Island, severe thunderstorms caused as much da more damage than Hurricane Sandy did in 2012. The power outage numbers were higher. The type of damage across central and southern Rhode Island was very significant. And then later in the day, we had less wind damage, though we still had some in pockets, and more very large hail, uh, up to two inches in diameter. August 4th, 2015 broke the hail record for the city of Boston. Um, and that was a very memorable severe weather day, two distinct periods of severe weather, one in the morning from about 5.30 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then another round in the afternoon from about 12.30 to 5.30 p.m. Um, flooding safety. Um, we want to remind folks, turn around, don't drown. Six inches of swiftly moving water can knock an adult off his or her feet. Two feet of water can make most cars and trucks float away. Six, maybe six inches if it's a zip car. But seriously, again, turn around, don't drown. This is from Tropical Storm Irene in southern Vermont in um, uh, a number of years ago. So keep that in mind from a, uh, uh, a flooding perspective that you don't want to travel through flooded roadways. And we'll talk a bit more about the reporting here uh, just in a few minutes. And then hurricane safety. Um, as we watch Al Roker here, any tropical system with the name in the Bahamas has the potential to quickly affect New England. And don't focus when the eye is going to make landfall because the effects of the hurricane or a tropical storm can be far away from the center. Um, certainly, um, Hurricane Sandy tracked into Cape May, New Jersey. We had hurricane force wind gusts in the southern half of southern New England. Tropical storm Irene, hurricane force winds and wind damage all the way out to the Cape and in, 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 in islands. So, um, Henri was more compact. It was more around Rhode Island and Southeast Mass. But again, those uh, impacts can go well away from the center. Uh, be aware of where you are with respect to the track of the eye. You want to run from the water and hide from the wind and be prepared because it's important to be self-sufficient for three plus days. Along and to the east of the, the center is where the strong winds are because you add the speed of forward motion. Along to the west side of the storm is where you get less winds, though you still get some but much heavier rain as the rain kind of lopsides over to the west side of the system in, in most cases. Winter safety, uh, we're out of winter now, I think safely, uh, but remember as we get into the later fall and winter months to prepare uh, your car and home with a winterize for a, with a disaster kit and have a plan in place to gather info about the hazards and meet with your family to create, implement, practice, and maintain your plan so you know what to do if you're caught Driving, outside, hypothermia, frostbite, et cetera, can be threats. So keep that in mind from a winter safety perspective. So now we're at the at some of the questions that were asked. Now you know how to be aware. Now you know how to be safe. Now what to look for while spotting. The spotter's role. What do you report? Thousands of lightning strikes per minute. There's a thousand house fires in my hometown of New Bedford from the lightning. Is that severe by weather service definition? No, it isn't. And the reason is the weakest of thunderstorms can produce a lot of lightning and potentially uh, house fires and such due to lightning. We like to hear about reports of damage or anyone um, hit by lightning, damage from lightning, um, particularly uh, house fires, etc. But lightning in and of itself is not a severe criteria. 50 inches of rain in an hour. 
Um, that's not severe by weather service definition, but it's certainly reportable. We want to hear about it. It could result in flash flood warnings and flash flood emergencies, but it's not severe. Severe is kind of focused on severe thunderstorms, and there's a specific criteria for that. Again, we want to hear the reports of that rainfall. We want to hear the reports of the flooding, but severe is kind of specific to winds greater than or equal to 58 miles an hour, hail greater than or equal to an inch in diameter, and tornado or any kind of wind damage to trees, power lines, certainly any kind of widespread uh, uh, damage. And we'll talk a little bit more. That's what severe is. And then we'll talk a bit about what the what is reportable criteria. And use the tell method, the time of the event, the event type, the location of view, the location of the weather event. At 6 p.m., I observed a wall cloud. I am about five miles south of Boston looking to my northwest. Uh, at 1133 a.m., I have a large tree down on Mandel Street in New Bedford, Massachusetts uh, um, from strong winds. That, that is a, a, a report using the tell method. We certainly want people to be more specific than this. Ohio, looking up at the sky. Um, how about giving a few more details uh, than that? Hopefully that won't happen in, in, in our area. Um, the three W's of reporting, we want the what type of event occurred. Hail, report the largest hailstone. If you want to give us a range in the hail size, is great, but make sure you include the largest hailstone. Wind, report the highest gust. When did the event happen? Is it current? Is it five minutes ago? And then where are you located? Where did it happen? And reporting a tornado, we, can, we certainly want to hear reports of wall clouds. And you see the stages here, the wall cloud stage, then the funnel cloud stage here, and then the uh, tornado stage, and you'll see how the EF3 tornado um, in Springfield area from June 1st, 2011, uh, picked up water from the Connecticut River. Obviously, reports in real time are, are, are preferred, but we take reports anytime because sometimes it's that report that comes in several hours later that kind of helps piece together what happened, uh, particularly with severe weather, but also in other situations. Reporting high winds, healthy branches or in trees four inches in diameter or larger. And although the severe criteria is 58 miles or greater, we want to hear about wind gusts 40 miles an hour or greater. So reportable is 40 miles an hour or greater, severe 58 miles an hour or greater. Any kind of building damage, power lines down, trees down. Again, reports in real time preferred, but we'll take reports anytime. Eh? I can tell you from some of our bigger weather events, sometimes we'll get the reports or there'll be pictures and videos, but internet is down, power is out. We'll get the, those pictures and videos several weeks later or a week or two later, and we'll, we'll put them into presentations like these. We put them into, uh, um, on social media as a collage from, a, from that um, significant weather event. Um, it can get used in, in many, many ways. So even though that report may not be seen in a storm report, et cetera, it gets used in many ways. This is uh, back to the August 4th, 2015 example in West Warwick, Rhode Island of some of the uh, high winds associated with the severe thunderstorms. And again, we can get those high winds from nor'easters, other wind events, doesn't have to be from severe storms on reporting those, those strong winds. From a hail perspective, hail pea size or larger. So basically an eighth inch in diameter or larger. We used to say any size hail, but some well-meaning spotters in Western Mass gave us reports of sand size hail. So maybe a few grains of sand, you know, about a, a, an eighth an inch in diameter uh, or about pea size hail. Uh, refer reports in inches, but can use common objects such as coins, athletic items, food. Just refrain from marble size hail because there can be different size marbles. Um, by official weather service definition, marble size hail is half inch in diameter. And again, we prefer reports in real time, but we'll gladly take reports anytime. Uh, reporting rainfall. Uh, two inches or more any time, one inch or more if it occurs in an hour or less. Observe river, small stream flooding, um, significant uh, street flooding that's closing roads or, or getting cars stuck in, in the roadway, uh, streams out of their banks. Uh, you see the video here of, of co compilation from Provincetown and Brookline. Remember, turn around, don't drown. Uh, again, reports in real time, but again, we take reports uh, anytime for the reasons that we already uh, stated. And you can see some of the examples of flooding here. And this is not a good idea of you driving through these areas like these folks are. You could get your car stuck. 
This is from the Mother's Day floods of 2006 up in the North Shore. Uh, some of the significant flooding there. And then when you're reporting flooding, keep in mind um, the, diff the different types of flooding you can get. So here right now, this road is definitely flooded. It's impassable. Right now, this car is stuck in it. It's and, and, But as time goes on here, the, the, the car will eventually slowly start floating down the road. And there was, they're pulling this person back away from the, the car. And so you know, be specific on, on how to report it. It's, the car is stuck. Now the car is, is being pushed and, and floated away. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, river rises uh, over its banks. This was the uh, Deerfield River at the Bridge of Flowers. It's flooding the road here and is at Bankful. It's almost at the, uh, the, the bottom of the bridge abutment here, as you'll see. And you can throw that information in your, in your description of, of, of what's happening and make sure you observe the flooding uh, uh, from a safe uh, uh, distance as well uh, when when reporting. And then you see this picture here. This is a road washout. So when there's water covering the roadway and the car stuck like up here, that's not a washout. That's just, that's flooded. It's criteria. We want to hear about it. But when the road is washed out, it means part or all the road is gone. And that's the, what we see in this picture here. That's what defines a road washout and something that we want uh, reported. So street flooding reports, this is a report got relayed to me in a photo from a coworker. Uh, I, I work at um, Dell Technologies. This was EMC Corporation because this was from 2009. This parking lot was flooded and there were some very upset workers at the facility in Southboro. And uh, my coworker got a picture of it and this was what he was seeing. This is my good friend Jim Palmer who coordinates Skyline up in the North Shore. This is not flooding here. Now, this picture could turn into the picture on the left. So um, we don't want to hear about this here. This is just some standing water. We do want to hear about things like this. And six, so six inches or more of water depth across the whole road, a road closed due to flooding. The left-hand picture depicts the street flooding. The right-hand picture does not. However, it continued to rain. And several hours later, this picture looked like the left-hand picture. So again, I wouldn't report this yet. But hey, if you see this, hmm, I may check that area again in a few hours, see how it's doing, because the rain's going to continue. That might turn into what we see on the left-hand side here. Reporting winter storms, ice jams, snow, coastal flooding, ice are all things you want to hear about. Um, ice jams, how much of the river is being blocked by the jam? Is it near any river bridges or bends? Ending fl flooding upstream due to the jam if and when the jam breaks. And I know the Ware River was an example. We had some, some photos there of an ice jam that caused flooding of the roadway and uh, was uh, photographed and uh, documented. Um, reporting snow. Report when at least two inches has fallen or if you get an inch or more in an hour. And we take final reports of snowfall at the end of the storm, kind of regardless of how much snow there is. Uh, snow squalls, thunder snow, a quick change from rain to snow or back. And certainly when we get our blizzards and stuff, getting an inch or more in an hour can happen for numerous hours. The point is getting periodic reports and then especially that final total at the end of the storm. S weather spotter, amateur radio, um, Skywarn spotter, Coco Rash, train spotter reports, etc., co-op observer reports are all factored in for FEMA disaster declarations for blizzards, like the blizzard we had in late January in portions of Eastern Mass. So that's how important these reports can be. So getting that final total is helpful as it can make the difference in a disaster declaration um, uh, for snow removal for uh, communities on a on a uh, county basis. So uh, something to keep in mind. And you can see the, the video here of the time lapse of the, the very heavy snow uh, in this uh, area here. I think believe that was in Connecticut. Reporting snow squalls. So snow squalls are important to report for a short-lived burst of heavy snowfall that's accompanied by gusty winds, reduced visibility, and quick snowfall accumulation. Uh, they can be similar to blizzard conditions, but localized and shorter in duration, and can cause chain reaction accidents resulting in injuries and deaths. And that happened in Pennsylvania uh, a couple of months ago here. This is an example of some snow squalls um, traversing the, the New York City area. And it goes from a uh, a fairly sunny day to suddenly uh, zero visibility and you can't see a thing. Not to mention, you know, snow can accumulate on roadways and quickly ice up causing accidents between the reduced visibility and the snowfall. They don't usually produce a ton of snow. Usually it's uh, a coating to an inch or two, 
but it's very intense and of rapid reduction in visibility and snowfall accumulation. So a snow squalls, we want to report a visibility less than a quarter mile. Pictures and videos of the snow squalls can be sent via social media and email. They're very useful because then you can kind of really see what's happening. Heavy snow, accidents due to the snowfall, and what the accumulation of snow was in that snow squall. Uh, measuring snow, you want to find a clear, flat, open area away from trees and buildings. Take several measurements around the area, avoid drifts and bare spots, and report the average value. Snowfall is rounded to the nearest tenth, so if you give us a report of five and a quarter inches of snow, we will round it up to 5.3 inches of snow. In terms of clearing your spot, it's not necessary, but if you do so and you do clear the snow, wait six hours between cleanings because we want to measure accumulation and not snowfall rate. Uh, reporting ice. Uh, there are different me methods of measuring ice accretion on surface objects, the two most standard being elevated horizontal ice thickness and elevated mean radial ice thicknesses. We try to uh, use elevated horizontal ice thickness because it's the easiest way to measure. So just read off the ruler here and that's your measurement. Certainly sending us pictures of the measurement and letting us know how you measured the ice is very helpful. Uh, coastal flooding, uh, structural damage, beach erosion, uh, uh, coastal uh, uh, roads flooded in various situations um, and getting pictures and video of that are very helpful. So we're always interested in, in, in this information, even if it's more minor street flooding of, of shore roads, because it, it's helpful in determining the type of flooding we'll get in a, a specific uh, um, coastal flood situation. So want to make sure we, we have that information um, uh, available during uh, coastal flooding. Reporting hurricanes, it's all the same criteria. We want the, the measured rainfall per the criteria, the measured wind gusts, uh, 40 miles an hour or greater per the criteria, trees down, wires down, structural damage, river, stream, urban, you know, street flooding, coastal flooding and the extent, but remember that safety is number one when reporting in hurricanes. It's very important that we, we report accurately because false reports, false warnings, no actions can lead to fatalities or injuries. So our advice is to take a deep breath, report only what you see, not what you think or wanted to see. As far as what you heard someone else saw, again, you have friends on social media, they got hit by the storm, they have storm damage photos, I mean, they're, and they're legit, send them on to us. Some of our amateur radio operators, we have the ability to monitor and relay reports from public safety, that is helpful. Just tell us that that's what you did, and then we'll sort out the information, and if needed, call public safety folks uh, uh, after the storm if we need to. Um, but getting that information in near real time can definitely help the warning process and stay calm because remember a lot of people are likely listening to what we are saying, especially in our coverage area. When folks in the media, et cetera, see Skywarn spotted reports, they, they, they trust them almost immediately. And we want to continue to, to have that trust, not only with the weather service, but media and other folks that use this information, both for the forecast warning process, as well as, uh, damage assessment after the fact. Some folks may have heard about what happened um, in um, Arkansas and the spotter network where they, a, a person was able to get in and report a, a tornado in Arkansas when they were actually living in, in, in Ohio and the weather service believed it. Last thing we want to have happen here, we want to report accurately, precisely. We can also support relaying information, but we be as precise as we can when, when we do it. Uh, reporting flooding and do's and don'ts. This is Hopkinton, Massachusetts um, um, from Eric Cardi. In this case, yes, there's a little bit of standing water in the travel lane, but it's not quite to reporting thresholds as yet. Whereas here in Newport, Rhode Island, this is seaweed and, and road debris thrown into the roadway with some splash over from coastal flooding. We definitely want to hear about that. This is flooding in Winchester, Mass, but it's it's really receded, and I would not call this reportable at, at that point in time. Whereas in Chester, Mass, this is flooding and, and a mudslide with debris and such in the roadway. Reporting wind damage do's and don'ts. Don't report small branches or twigs. Remember, four inches in diameter or larger, but certainly whole trees and whole large branches, please do. If you get twigs like this that are downed by ice, let us know that, and they're also a great way to report the ice thickness, so uh, keep that in mind. With wind damage do's and don'ts, report what you see, not what you think or wanted to see. If you come across an area 
but the storm has passed, but you see trees down on the roadway, just say I have several 10-inch diameter trees down due to the strong, some strong winds from the passing storm. And we'll sort out, is it a microburst, straight line wind damage, tornadic, etc. Reporting do's and don'ts on clouds. Again, so this was a cloud feature in Ellington, Connecticut, and I believe it was on a day that we did have some tornadic activity, though not in Ellington, um, you know, but in the, in, in the uh, nearby areas. So we see some upward motion here, but not really attached to the cloud base. So this is something we watch. We'd see how it would evolve um, uh, and see if it actually gets connected to the cloud base and gives some evidence to some possible uh, rotation and, and such that would would be indicative of something that needs to be reported. Uh, this is uh, Witch Church, England in 2011. Again, this, this looks connected to the cloud base, but I don't see much upward motion or rotation. It might be on the leading edge of the storm here. So again, something I'd watch. Nothing here that I see uh, uh, reportable. I would just keep an eye on it, see what, what, what happens with it. But um, nothing here that would be reportable as yet, but something to watch. And that is a bird, not debris. So still nothing really to uh, uh, report about here. So uh, again, just some do's and don'ts on reporting clouds. Again, lightning, don't report there's a lot of lightning. Be aware of the lightning threat. If you know of a house fire due to lightning, someone struck by lightning, et cetera, definitely let us know about that. And lightning is, the un is underrated and the number two weather-related killer. So remember that from a safety perspective. We talked about preparedness, the websites, the social media, the web and mobile apps for reporting, the time of the event, the event type, the location of you and the location of the event, and then have a plan in place for the weather hazards and meet with your family to create, implement, practice, and maintain your plan. We talked about at NWS Boston and at WX1BOX on social media. So how to get info to NWS. So when this presentation is done, there is, when it, at your leisure, it doesn't have to be right after the class, there's a 20 question online quiz, and when you pass that quiz, you will be sent a spotter ID card um, uh, via email uh, that has a nice ruler, the logo, and the 800 number uh, to call in reports. Uh, do not call 911 unless it's a major catastrophe, although we'll hit a couple of examples where it's a good idea to call. Uh, Weather.gov slash box slash spotter report form, great way to report rainfall and snowfall reports, not so much to report a tornado on the ground or wind damage. Certainly social media, you know, tag us at WX1BOX or at NWS Boston and at, w, at WX1BOX for information. Amateur radio operators, we encourage everybody to monitor the various um, sky one frequencies that are on our listing here. You go right to WX1BOX.org, you can get that. We are also on Echolink, star NEW ENG3 star, Echolink Conference, node 9123, and also on IRLP. We talked a little bit about DMR. We do have some folks that help us with monitoring that, and we're going to try to directly monitor that as we go forward in the future. On Echolink and IRLP, you can simply call for WX1BOX or myself, KD1CY, as we're typically uh, monitoring there along with several others. Uh, there is also the COCO RAS program, Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. That's a network that reports rainfall and snowfall, even if there's zero precipitation and any kind of hail uh, daily. Uh, CocoRAS.org for, for more information. Many Skywarn spotters are COCO RAS observers and vice versa. So mentioning that here. Again, the Enhanced Hazardous Weather Outlook is a way to gather information, and this is the Skywarn page. Um, you can see the refresher training and online quiz, inf quiz that is available. We try to have folks retrain every five years to keep knowledge fresh. Also, um, uh, give us updated uh, addresses and contact information. Uh, uh, we get a number of addresses that are invalid. People have moved. There, uh, uh, some, some folks have left us. Um, you know, there's over 8,000 uh, names in our spotter database, so we're trying to keep that information uh, current. So uh, keep that in mind um, from a retraining perspective. So now we're into the review section. So this is Provincetown, so we'll play the video here through and we'll see uh, uh, what kind of weather do we see here. So as we uh, go forward here, it kind of looks like it's horizon to horizon. So this looks like uh, the potential for um, strong to damaging winds under a shelf cloud. And you see the skull and crossbones uh, uh, flag there that, that may be what, what's to come with those winds. 
So what would we report here? So it's kind of a video clip. Um, looks like there might be some upward motion here. And then as video clips forward, it looks like there's a fire. For myself, I don't really know. I, I, it could be a, a lightning strike that caused a fire. It could be a fire that was burning while the storm was developing. So I don't know what, what happened here uh, based on these videos uh, clips. So that would be my answer to what uh, here. And I wouldn't report anything in this case. Night after heavy rainfall fell in town, you drive up the road and you see this. Would you call the weather service? I absolutely. This is a road washout. Also, the fact that you drove up to it, I would say, uh, I recall a Skywarn training session. We had the former fire chief from the town of Hingham, Mark Duff, on, and he said this is a case you'd also call your police or fire department so that they block off this road so that they can't drive up and see this, or if they're not paying attention, drive into it. So this would be a case I'd also, if you could drive up to that, you want to call the, the public safety and have them close the roadway. You wake up in the morning and head outside and you see this on the trees. Would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This is a half inch of ice on an elevated surface. We definitely want to call this into national weather. Cold winter's night and this is happening in your backyard. Uh, would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This is uh, coastal flooding splash over over the, the sea barrier here causing minor flooding um, uh, on the other side of this uh, small a seawall barrier. So we definitely want to hear about this. Summer vacation on the Cape and you see this, would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This is two water spouts. It looks like it's kind of fair weather. It was actually a thunderstorm in the area. One of these water spouts would actually flip over a uh, lifeguard stand and would actually be classified as a weak EF0 tornado. And this happened in the Manament section of Plymouth. What would we report here? Well, I don't see anything reportable. Um, I see a low cloud deck here, but there's nothing of a reportable or, or severe criteria here. Now we'll go to through in Coventry, uh, Connecticut. This is July 10th, 2020, uh, 2013. And I'll play the audio here too. So what we can see here is a, uh, certainly a funnel cloud. Hard to tell if it's on the ground right now. So I would call in the funnel cloud report and then keep an eye on it, monitor it. It looks like a pretty safe spot to monitor it. And you can see uh, it continues to organize. It may be close to being on the ground. I, I, I'm not sure I'd call it in just yet, but it's very close. And then uh, as you continue to see it develop and evolve, you see the debris here. Then you can call it in and say uh, the tornado is, the funnel cloud has touched down as a tornado. I saw debris get thrown in the air. I don't, don't know the extent of the damage, but you know that, the, 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 that there was that debris. And certainly if you've got a video, you would send that into the weather service. You could do it by uh, the various social media outlets, et cetera. And um, this would then get looked at um, in a storm uh, uh, survey. So, and then you can see here that the tornado continued on the ground. Now it looks like it may have dissipated. You may want to report in that it appears to have, have, have lifted and dissipated, even if only... Uh, uh, tempor temporarily. You're driving into the city and you see this. Would you call the weather service? Absolutely. This was from the remnants of Tropical Storm Wee that caused significant flooding in Fall River. Yes, this is a typical flood prone spot in Fall River, but it's not so typical to have that flooding be up to the hood and trunk of the vehicle. So uh, you definitely want to uh, call this in. You're driving into the city and you see this, would you call the weather service? Yes, I would say this is the kind of the minimum criteria for wind damage. These are about four inch diameter branches that are downed. Um, they look pretty healthy. I don't, we don't expect folks to be tree wardens, but they look pretty healthy. I would call this into national weather. And in conclusion, and I'll let the audio play. Somebody needs to call and say, yeah, there actually is one on the ground. No, it's coming right at us. <laughs> it does look like it's coming right at us. I mean, are we supposed to go to the basement or should we actually try to vacate? It does. Why don't we stand here? It's definitely brewing. Yeah, I guess. So, too, I don't think it's that big, huh? It looks like it's going to hit the house. 
So, yes, we would definitely want you to report this, and uh, that the tornado's on the ground. And, yes, you should take cover in your basement. And, well, I, I don't know what to say about it not being that big. It certainly is a, a lar large tornado, especially for our area. Uh, and then certainly after the storm has passed, if it's safe to do so, you can um, then describe the damage, take pictures, et cetera, of the damage, and send that into uh, national weather, social media, uh, et cetera. So uh, definitely uh, you want to report in, take cover after it's passed, report the damage and, and, and such that that's occurred, and, and send that into national weather. So I want to thank everybody for their time today. As I said, it was kind of a good weather day uh, for this uh, class, given the cloudy uh, and cool conditions. Um, remember that to become a spotter, you go weather.gov uh, slash Boston slash Skyworn under resources, choose Skyworn virtual training online quiz and take the quiz. And if you pass it, you will get your spotter ID. Please allow like a month before you get the email with the spotter ID. Um, there's been a number of training classes, uh, Bryce Williams, the Weather Service Skyworn Program Lead also does shift work, et cetera. He, 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 he sends these cards out uh, via email as quickly as he can, um, but it may take him some time. So if you don't hear something in about a month or so, certainly you can shoot Bryce an email at his address below or shoot me an email and I'll, I'll mention it to Bryce and, and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we get you um, uh, taken care of here. So, uh, uh, so appreciate everybody's time. Why don't I go ahead and look at the uh, uh, the uh, questions here, and we'll uh, take any here as we uh, close out the uh, uh, the the training. Um, what does it mean when the light turns green, like the atmospheric light? Yes, yeah, sometimes when you get a greenish shade to the clouds, it certainly could be an indication of hail. Doesn't necessarily tell you size, but there could be some hail in that storm. It's how the the sunlight reflects off of hail. So that's one thing um, uh, that uh, uh, can, that's what kind of the greenish tinge can show. Uh, can you determine the difference between a tornado that's not rain wrapped and a rain wrapped tornado? That's a good question. In two, 2011, um, I mean, you could, you, you, you had an idea just based on the reports, but um, there were some enhancements to Doppler radar with the, uh, with a feature called the cor correlation coefficient that based on the, the different thresholds of, of what that cor correlation coefficient shows, uh, it can tell you the difference between whether it's debris, whether it's hail, whether it's rain, et cetera, and there's different thresholds. And I, I honestly don't know those thresholds off the top of my head, but that feature is what helps you tell the difference if it's rain wrapped or not, or if it's debris and, and, and so, so forth. Um, if um, I, I, regarding flooding, if 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 a drainage pipe or culvert is is full, if it's flooding the roadway, it's good to report. If it's not flooding the roadway, um, uh, then I would not report it. Uh, can you explain about tornadoes uh, that are embedded in hurricanes? Um, yes, so we can get tornadoes inside of hurricanes. They they they, they are are formulated due to the extreme winds and and, and that can be in hurricanes and. Um, and just the, the and there's turning in the atmosphere, et cetera. Uh, usually, though, they, they, they are like convection or thunderstorms. They may not have a ton of lightning in it. And and honestly, a lot of the tornadoes we had, they were in tropical type environments, remnant tropical systems in a few cases, or just a very tropical air mass. And that's why they, they tend to be on the weaker side. Sometimes you get stronger tornadoes, but generally they're they're they're, they're on the weaker side. And it's the same uh, process as what would happen with severe thunderstorms. And they're usually thunderstorms embedded um, in the uh, uh, hurricane uh, 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 structure. Um, so for wind speed, rate of rainfall. So so rainfall can only be reported um, via, you know, rainfall can only be reported with a measured uh, rain gauge. Now, it doesn't need to be the super electronic $300 rain gauge. In fact, it, with the Cocoa RAS program, there's a, a specific plastic style rain gauge for $30 that you can buy um, that measures the rainfall. You have to be there to actually look at it because it's a plastic manual gauge, but that's a good way to, to measure rainfall and know the, the rate. For wind speeds, you can estimate to a degree, typically leaves blowing off the trees and small twigs and stuff that are down are indicative of a wind estimate of 40 miles an hour or greater. But if you don't have an instrument, I would, 
I would encourage folks just to, to report the wind damage when it's that, that four inch diameter uh, uh, threshold and larger and that the trees look fairly healthy. Um, uh, so that would, would be helpful. Uh, if there's a, I don't know if there's a quiz on the New York City Weather Service um, Skywarn page. If there is, you should take that quiz. If not, you could take ours and we can, um, um, uh, you know, so, e you know, either, either way. Um, Chris had a question. Is it preferred on how to report? Is it preferred to call over social media? I mean, I, I, I think one thing that's good about social media, Chris, is if you got pictures and videos, we can see it. If you tag both us and NWS on it, NWS gets busy. So sometimes if you just tag them, they may not respond. They're not trying to ignore you. They're just very busy. They're trying to forecast the weather and look at this when you're, when you send it to us, we're focusing, we're looking at the weather too, but we're focusing more about, um, the, we're, we're focused more on the reports and getting it to the weather service. So if you tag us both on there, that's helpful. A lot of times rate the amateur radio side is very good when you're mobile, you can't send stuff, you know, as easily, or you have to pull over, et cetera. And sometimes giving that verbal report followed by the pictures and videos afterwards is, uh, is helpful just to get that information out as, uh, um, uh, quickly as, as you can. Um, can you report rear flank down, Jeff, when there's a high risk for a tornado in the area? Yeah, just wait for the actual wall cloud. You can report the wall cloud if it's there or funnel cloud or tornado. I wouldn't just report whether there's a, a rear flank downdraft unless you're actually in the downdraft and it's causing damage. Um, to become a spotter, uh, you got to be 16 years of age or older unless you're a Boy Scout, Girl Scout, amateur radio operator, similar program. Um, then we... Uh, uh, take uh, folks that are in uh, those programs uh, younger. Uh, the resources tab, again, uh, I'll, I'll take this, uh, see if I can, I guess I'm going to have to close this here, weather.gov slash Boston slash Skywarn, and it'll be kind of a embedded uh, page with a series of tabs, and it'll show the resources tab. Please be sure you're using a sanctioned web browser like Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome or Firefox. Internet Explorer is no longer re no, no longer supported. And I had at least one case where a person couldn't get to the resources tab. And I think it was because they were using that browser. Uh, it's not supported. So it's not, um, it, it, it may not give you the, the, uh, the good results. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, I don't think I see any other questions. Um, so, um, I appreciate everyone's time today. I think it was a great session and I, I do have this recorded, so I'm hoping I can get gain access to it, and we'll get that um, posted up on our YouTube feed. I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, training. For any mothers in the audience, happy Mother's Day coming up tomorrow. I hope everybody in, it has a great weekend. Um, we'll get folks signed up to our Skyward email list, and um, I enjoyed presenting to everybody today. And I uh, hope everybody got a lot out of it. And uh, please spread around to your friends and such. This is the last class of the uh, uh, spring season, but we sometimes uh, will do a handful of, of online classes again uh, later in the summer and, and, and fall. Um, and, and to specific uh, amateur radio clubs, specific uh, cert groups, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if folks uh, are interested in, 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 in spreading uh, the word to other folks. So I, again, appreciate everyone's uh, uh, time today. I do think I see, uh, I see a lot of thanks and comments here. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, great to have you guys uh, on. Um, so thanks to everybody. Uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Have a great weekend and enjoy the rest of it. Thank you.